Important. Dull customization is not meant for children. These are art pieces created by experienced artists using potentially harmful materials and processes, including spraying toxic aerosols, using knives, saws, flammable chemicals such as acetone, skin and eye irritants such as clays and glues with toxic fumes, and specialty paints and glosses identified as potentially carcinogenic. Destroying and upcycling figures and dolls is dangerous and causes irreversible damage to personal property. Therefore, viewer discretion is advised and younger audiences should not view this content without adult supervision. We recommend watching the YouTube Kids app instead for kid-appropriate content. Hi everyone, it's me, Diana, the Doll Fairy. I've missed you guys. I'm so happy to see you back here on my channel as we finish up the Pokemon Zodiac series together. Today we're about to get to the long-awaited star sign of Gemini, which is represented by the symbol of twins. So I knew that I wanted to do a pair of related Pokemon for this sign. There are a ton of pairs of Pokemon to choose from, but of course I wanted to choose one that was epic and probably legendary. A lot of people suggested Latios and Latias, which is a very cool selection, and they would probably make for very good doll designs with their armor and wing apparatus things and whatnot. But I've never been a huge fan of these Pokemon because I kind of missed out on Gen 3 the first time around and couldn't really get into the remakes much. And although they do look really cool, I don't love how they look sort of robotic instead of organic, if you know what I mean. From the beginning, I thought the coolest pair of Pokemon to represent Gemini would be Mew and Mewtwo. They have a special place in my heart because they're from Gen 1. They're unequivocally cool looking Pokemon with Mew's simplicity and cuteness and Mewtwo's intimidating look. And they're both very different from each other despite Mewtwo being made from Mew's DNA and therefore being a sort of a clone of Mew. They have such different personalities to them that I thought it would be a lot of fun to make them as a pair because of their duality and the juxtaposition of Mew's sweet and carefree personality with Mewtwo's brooding, tortured hatred of mankind. A lot of this impression comes from Pokemon the first movie, of course, which harkens back to my childhood nostalgia. Today's video will be focused on the making of my Mew doll, while the next video will show you how I made Mewtwo, and then you'll be able to see the pair together. I'm approaching Mew as basically a futuristic, magical girl character in space. <laughs> I'm not sure how else to explain that, but that's the aesthetic that I'm going for. For Mew, I knew I wanted to use Farrah Goodfairy from Ever After High. Her face mold features an adorable, squinty-eyed smile, and her skin tone is a pearlescent pink that's perfect for Mew. However, I also wanted Mew to have the shorter Ever After High body type, so that she could be noticeably small compared to Mewtwo. Plus, I don't think any of the other Zodiac dolls have been on the shorter body so far, so it makes for some more variety. So I decided to use the pale pink body of a Bunny Blanc doll with the Vera Good Fairy head and hands. The difference between both skin tones is practically invisible, and the shimmer in the face is fine because plenty of artists add shimmer to their dolls' faces anyway, like it's just part of the makeup, so I'm not really concerned about that. I'll be rerouting Farrah, so I remove her factory hair. Then I remove both dolls' heads from their bodies by first dunking them in near-boiling water, then yanking off the heads with a delicate twisting motion so as not to break the neck pegs. <laughs> I use jewelry pliers to scrape out the inside of the scalp, pulling the glue and remaining hair um, from inside the holes. Then I pull all of that stuff out of the neck hole and the head is clean. I then use some pure acetone nail polish remover on a cotton ball to remove the painted features on her face as well as on the scalp. Now she's ready for a reroute. I'm going to be giving her pale pink hair in the shade Baby Unicorn from the Doll Planet. This color is such a pretty and lustrous pink that will match her pink skin quite well. After cutting the longer hank of hair in half, I start rerouting using my rerouting tool, which can also be found on the Doll Planet's website, link in description. I take a small pinch of hair, wrap it around my finger, scoop up the hair into the needle that's been cut at an angle, and push the hair into each hole in the head. I leave the part line for last, at which point I crisscross the hair in an alternating pattern in order to fully cover the scalp. When the reroute is finished, after applying some glue through the neck hole, I cover up the hair with a cloth pinned at the hairline in order to protect it from the sealant. 
Outside in my backyard with my respirator mask on, I apply Mr. Super Clear in three separate layers before I start the face up. For Mew's face, I'm keeping my Mew figurine close by for inspiration. I note that the shape of Mew's eye is very rounded on the top, with a straight line for the bottom eyelid. Farah's face mold will work well for a shape that's similar to this, because of the sort of upturned shape of the eyes, and the way that she's smiling makes her cheeks rounded at the bottom of the eye. I don't know how to explain it in a clearer way, but I do my best to replicate that kind of shape as I'm outlining Mew's eyes. I also want to apologize for the camera angle here. It wasn't the best idea <laughs> because I am right-handed and my hand keeps getting in the way. So next time I will not do that. This face-up is really enhanced by the face sculpt, and I really enjoyed working on it more than usual, just because from the very beginning she was looking so cute and happy. I'm adjusting the eyebrows since this is still the first layer and I can easily erase and redraw elements. Mew has sky blue eyes and this color is so much fun in coordination with the pastel pink skin tone. For the outline of the features, I started by sketching in this purplish color of watercolor pencil, and I thought I would later go over it in browns and even some black. However, as I refined the outlines in purple, I really liked how it looked against the pink, and I decided to just keep the outlines in this purplish color. I give her eyelashes, but I'm keeping this face up in a pretty simple anime style, which I think you may know is pretty much my favorite way to go. I want the doll to feel like Mew, so I want to keep the features in that simple, classic anime style so she will still give off that kind of vibe. Before sealing this layer, I'm going to use pastels for blushing and on the lips. I'm using a rosy purple color for the blush, which is very similar to the purple color I've been using for the outlines of her eyes and eyelashes. I think the blush looks so darn cute on those smiley cheeks. I can't say enough how much I love this sculpt. And after sealing the first layer, from here it's pretty straightforward. I will go over the outlines and make the colors more vibrant, and I will also devote a lot of my attention to creating a pretty gradient in her irises. I will not actually be giving her a pupil in her eyes because I'm staying true to the Pokemon's design, so that light blue color will really be very prominent in her face. When I start creating some variation in the irises in these subsequent layers, I just love how the blues look. They already look like the eyes have a glow to them. When I add some black into the mix at the very top of the eyes, that effect is immediately intensified. It's definitely my favorite part of doing a face up, seeing the eyes transform in this way. It's hard to see it here because of this angle, but I'm taking my white watercolor pencil and adding some eyelashes in white to add to the face's ethereal kind of feeling. And now we reinforce the blushing and repeat the process for another layer or two until the colors look very vibrant.
If you would like to watch a more in-depth video and listen to me explain in more detail how I approach this face-up, there is an in-depth face-up video on Patreon for patrons at the Wondrous Wish Granter level or above. Once that's done, we can add the highlights in the eyes. I'm referencing official art of Mew before I decide exactly where to place the shines with white acrylic paint. I was definitely tempted to add more shines than just the main ones, but I didn't want to stray from how Mew is usually depicted, so I restrained myself. I also add some white to accentuate the whites of the eyes, as well as the white eyelashes I drew in. Now I gloss her lips with some Sculpey Gloss and her face is complete. I'm really pleased with how cute she is. Now we can move on to her outfit. I want her outfit to look sort of futuristic and spacey in a really cute and girly way. Not a practical way. <laughs> For the shorts and the top, I'm going to use this white vinyl material that to me looks a little bit like fake leather on a doll scale. For patterns, I'm reusing and tweaking patterns I made for my Kingdom Hearts Aqua Dolls outfit. The top will be this crop halter top with iridescent pink fabric flaring out from the bottom hemline. Sometimes I don't think things through well enough. <laughs> Luckily for me, even though I messed up my plan for the closure in the back, Using a hook and eye closure on the very edges added just enough length to the circumference of the top that I was able to close it in the back. Thank goodness. <laughs> Thankfully, the shorts were pretty straightforward and I didn't have to hem anything with this fabric because it doesn't fray at all, which is very nice. The pattern for the iridescent part was more complex than I had imagined it would be. But I adore this fabric. It's just so magical and pretty. If you remember, I used this fabric on my Mega Diancy doll way back in the beginning of the Zodiac series. I also didn't have a good plan for attaching this part. Um, as it is now, the top isn't really removable because of the way that I ended up putting things together, but that's fine. <laughs> but look, I can use the sewing machine now. I've been intimidated by it for so long that it really feels like a major accomplishment to me that I now enjoy using the sewing machine. So hopefully that means more good things ahead in terms of sewing doll clothes. <laughs> This fabric is gorgeous, but it's very tricky to work with, so I did my best. I wanted it to be flared out, so I had to pleat it in places at the top, which was confusing to me, but I think it worked out okay. Now that the basic outfit is complete, let's iron out some of the details. Mew will of course need a tail. I have this Monster High cat tail, which was actually removed from the doll I used for Mega Diancy. Uh, I'm going to have to modify it with epoxy sculpt to look like Mew's tail, but for now I need to figure out how to attach it. I'm too chicken to use a motorized drill like many people would do. So I made a contraption out of jewelry wire to hold the tail in place, but still leave it free enough to kind of twist it around if I want to.
I used an X-Acto knife to make a deeper groove in the plastic for the wire to hang onto. The wire will later be covered up by a belt that I will be making out of foam, along with the rest of the armor pieces. Perhaps not the most sophisticated solution, but it's creative problem solving nonetheless. Mew has those little ears, or at least what kind of look like cat ears, on its head. My Mew doesn't need to have cat ears because I don't want her to seem like a cat, but my idea was to give her a headband with ears, just like those cat ear headphones I always wanted but never got. <laughs> kind of like a Vocaloid aesthetic, you know? It feels techy and spacey to me. I also hacked up some shoes that I didn't end up using because they just didn't feel right to me for this character. So she's gonna end up not having shoes but having armor on her legs. Now for some sculpting. Mewtwo will require more sculpting than Mew, which is why I'm mixing so much of this two-part epoxy sculpt, but you'll see that in the next video. For Mew, I'm pretty much adding a shape onto the end of her tail, as you can sort of see here. And then I'm sculpting the little ear shapes onto the headband. I also at first made these rounded squares to go over the ears as part of the headphone, you know, like the over ear part of the headphone. However, I changed my mind about that because I decided to put some cool armor pieces over the ears instead, which we're just about to start working on. Here we go. I drafted some patterns for what I wanted the armor pieces to look like. I changed some of my designs from the concept sketch. I didn't want the armor pieces to be too similar to what I did for Solgaleo, which was our first Zodiac Pokemon. So I made sure that the shapes were different so that the overall feel would be clearly different. Mew will have armor pieces on the forearms, calves, shoulders, hips, and now also over the ears. I trace all the pieces I'll need out of white foam and get cutting. Once all of my pieces are cut out, I start shaping them using the candle method I originally learned from Delightful's Doll Armor tutorial. I sort of hover my foam pieces over the candle until it gets hot and a little bit floppy, and then I shape it to the doll's body. When the pieces cool, they should be formed that way and will sit nicely when glued onto the arms, legs, etc. Now it's time to paint all of the pieces. I'm starting with a pale pink for the tail and the headband that is meant to match the pink of her skin. For the armor, I'm using a pearlizing paint, which is adding a subtle metallic shimmer to the white. After all of the pieces are painted and dried, I give them a couple of coats of Liquitex matte varnish to seal in the paint job and give it some protection from chipping or peeling. Now to deal with the hair. This shot is from right after the reroute, and as you can see, if you get past how creepy the face looks blank like that, <laughs> the hair is very puffy standing away from the scalp. So I tried to get the hair to calm down and flatten by boil washing it, which was not quite enough the first time around. Then I used a combination of heat, moisture, and cold, along with pressing the hair down with pieces of freezer bag to keep it in place, and then leaving it that way for like at least 48 hours. It was a long process. And even after all that, it's still not quite as flattened as I would like, but it's close enough. I reattach the head to the body, and then after playing with her hair a bit, decide to pull the front pieces back with a hairband and a clip. My original plan was to give her short hair, but with the way her hair was still puffed out, I knew that would not look good. 
I really should have used yarn if I wanted to give her a short hairstyle, I guess, but I really wanted to use the baby unicorn hair from the doll planet. Now we can glue on the armor. I know that I could have made the armor more realistic by making it removable or at least fastened with straps or something, but I approached this design like an anime character and anime designs do not worry about stuff like functionality. <laughs> you don't need stuff like straps or buckles in a magical girl outfit. Plus, I'm lazy, so I like it this way. <laughs> I used my trusty fast grab tacky glue, which almost never fails me. And I mean, really, none of this armor has any practical function. I mean, look at it. This is all about aesthetics. I don't want to get glue on her hair or face, so for the ones over the ears, I use a pin stuck into the head on either side to keep those in place. Now for that finishing touch, she definitely needs some rhinestones. As usual, I have to make sure not to go overboard with those and keep it tasteful. In case you're wondering about that tool I'm using to apply them, it's literally a toothpick with a dried up blob of pink paint on one end. <laughs> Once I'm working on stuff, I don't like having to get up to look for more supplies, so I tend to use whatever scraps of things are on hand where I'm sitting. And now we're just about finished. Okay, it's time for some doll magic, everyone. Did you miss it? Thing is, magic is for everybody of all ages, so we all get to enjoy it. Let's call up some of that nostalgia you might feel from your interactions with Mew. Perhaps in the original Pokemon games, you did the cheat code so you could find Mew under a truck. <laughs> Or perhaps seeing the first ever Pokemon movie that I can still remember seeing in theaters in 1999. And then we'll mix that with some new inspiration and I'll just wave my wand and... I really love Mew because of how happy and serene she looks, and I also really like her cute, spacey style. I can't wait to show you Mew 2 next, and then you'll be able to see the two side by side. They really complement each other nicely because they're very different from each other in terms of the vibe they give off, but they have some similar design elements that hopefully tie them together as a cohesive pair that's in obvious juxtaposition with one another. So make sure you tune in next time for that video, which is coming up very soon. If you're not subscribed, please do and hit that notification bell so you won't miss it. We are on our way to completing the Pokemon Zodiac and I am so excited about that. <laughs> I would like to say thank you to each and every one of my lovely patrons, both past and present, whose love and support helps make this dull magic possible. If you would like to join the Doll Fairy Patreon and get access to stuff like exclusive collaborations, behind the scenes content, previews, early access to videos, and in-depth tutorials such as a real-time video featuring this doll's face-up, 
check out patreon.com slash the doll fairy or click on the link in the description below. Thank you so much for joining me today and I'll see you again for more doll magic. Bye.